welcome to this very first episode of Dil Se. My name is Nidhi Razdan and we're going to be in conversation with one of India's best known legal minds, one of India's most prominent politicians, member of parliament, former law minister Kapil Sibyl. Well, it's a great time to actually begin this series of conversations with Mr. Sibyl because there's a lot happening. There are state elections coming up, there's a general election in the middle of next year and in between, there's a whole lot of stuff that keeps happening. There's never a dull moment news-wise. And what better a week to begin this show than in the week where we've had a special session of Parliament, a historic session in which the Women's Reservation Bill was finally passed. Kapil Sibyl, we thought this was a great opportunity to begin the conversation here. In fact, um, the Women's Bill was actually first uh, talked about and brought into Parliament when I was in college in the mid-90s. <laughs> so That's good, 1996. Yeah, so I was in college then, so I remember doing college debates about it. But just to get an overall perspective from you first, in terms of the impact this will have on our political landscape whenever it is implemented, how huge is it? We cannot say at this point in time. See, the country is ready for the bill. But those who are pushing it are not ready for it. Why do you say that? If they were ready for it, they would have introduced it in 2014. You know very well that barring some three or four parties, basically RJD, at, some, at one point JDU, Samajwadi Party, Congress Party was always supporting it and actually in 2010 they moved it. And this has been going on since 1996, as you mentioned, then Vajpayee came in 1998, then it fell through. Gujaralji reintroduced it earlier, then 1999 again. So this has been going on. But the fact of the matter is that even if it is passed, and it's going to be, take some time before it is passed, it doesn't convince me that this government was actually genuine and wanting to actually pass this bill immediately. Because had they been genuine in 2014, it would have been done. I'm going to come to the political question later uh, in terms of its intent. But the fact is, it's, it's happened now. And it, it's not it, happened. Well, it will happen. Or I don't it's, know. It's, when? You don't I know. don't know. I'll tell you the reason why. Are you saying it's because of the, the link to the census and delimitation, etc.? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You see what happened? If you look at the history of our country, if, a census, it's a decadal census. It takes place every 10 years, 1951, 61, right through. But in 2021, we've had no census. You know, so since 2011 now, we're in 2023, we have no census. COVID was cited as the reason for not having yeah. it in 21, but after that, we don't know Three why. Three countries it, in the world, yeah. despite COVID, went through the census. You had China going through it, you had the US, you had the UK. We could have done it. And COVID ended in 2020. Between 2020 and 2023, why was it not done? So are you saying you have doubts about whether, even though the bill has been passed by Parliament, it would actually come into force in the near future? I don't think so. Not in 2029. i tell you why. Now, the last delimitation that was done was in 1976. There was a delimitation in 52, 62, 71 was the census, started in 72, took four years for delimitation to complete. Then we had the 84th Constitutional Amendment, says that we will freeze the delimitation and do a census in 2026. Now, 2026, if you start doing the census, and as you know, that that's a huge exercise. We've got 1.4 billion people now. So it will take one, one and a half years because you have to have house to house enumeration, right? Not only that, if you're going to include caste in it, which is going to be the demand of a large section of North India, and I don't think that the BJP will be able to resist that demand. Because if they resist that demand, they might lose the election. Because we're talking about, um, within the OBCs, uh, the backwards to be also counted, and reservation for the backward OBC women as well. If you start doing that, that will take much longer. And if it took four years for delimitation to happen, because, because the, the constituencies have to be frozen, the districts have to be changed, the boundaries have to be changed in every state in this country, that's an enormous exercise. So you're saying the earliest we're looking at a possible reservation? 2034. 2034. 2034. Yeah. So we're still 10 years away from yes, that moment. A long, long time. 
which which is an interesting point i was going to ask you about that in more detail why do you think that the government then was so keen to make such a big deal about it by calling a special session in the very dramatic way that it did keeping the agenda secret i mean actually this bill could have been passed in the winter session of parliament well, absolutely. so was it done now with an eye on state polls and the lok sabha without a doubt in 2023 why would they have a special session for doing for doing this i mean why did you wait 9 years and the government has not answered that in parliament the question to be asked is and the prime minister and the and the law minister should have explained why did they not do it in 2014 there is no answer and why now for the simple reason but i think that there is a general fatigue that set in as far as this government is concerned and i think they want to catch uh, catch at some issue that will take them through the 2024 election Uh, i think this is one of them see it, it's very clear that as far as vote voters are concerned women voters obcs they're really going to be very key in the next general election so in that sense you don't think that this is something that mr modi has done that's actually going to work to his advantage he's already got a lot of schemes directed at women women voters they have a good uh, you know following among women voters the bjp does so whatever the reason may be even if it didn't happen for 9 years the fact that they've done it now and in this sort of dramatic way special See, session can, you don't it, think that will work to his advantage it can work against them How? it can also work against them because one uh, the 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 campaign of the opposition will have to be why did they not do it when they had a chance to do it in 2014 we would have got it by 2019 why did they wait now that's one one kind of campaign that will is bound to happen number 2 the backward uh, within the backward right who are not included in the bill i think will get alienated and you will have a schism there now they can't afford not to include the backwards and they have not done it but they can't afford to include them also because there's a backlash there as well so it's it's for them it was a hobson's choice it it could also strike a chord with women voters the What intent chord? the they intent don't, they don't they know if the intent was there they would have done it in 2014 but can i ask you a broader question uh, at least amongst the political class were are india's political parties really ready for this kind of change and i ask this simply because uh even though the participation of women in elections has dramatically increased in the last few decades and we've got election commission data to to show that but when it comes to distribution of tickets to women with the exception of say the tmc or the bjd most parties including the congress which you were part of at one point they haven't really given women uh, a great number of tickets to contest i mean is there really an in, i mean is there really are we ready for that change I, I, let me put it this way there is a political compulsion Now. this must be done which is if you really look at say the brics countries for example uh south africa has women 35% reservation china 25% russia 16% brazil 18% india 15.2% 13% of the legislative assemblies and uh, if you look at overall It, just the states themselves it's only 9% yeah less forget than about parliament yeah. it's only 9% so the whole world nepal has 33% women right bangladesh has more pakistan has 20% bangladesh has 21% and i think the bjp 15%. only has some 42 women mps out absolutely. of its 300 plus absolutely. right yeah absolutely absolutely so the see the i don't think we can ignore this i think every political party has to support it is compelled to support it and it needs to be supported every right thinking indian must support it the question is if you were so keen to do something like this which is in your interest why did you not do it in 2014 well you're right obviously things have changed you mentioned uh, you know the socialist parties and how they opposed it once upon a time and, and are supporting it today including the sp uh, and and the rjd in no, parliament they're not supporting it they are saying we support with the caveat it. with the but caveat but that's the that's the politics but th- exactly so even the congress has changed its position yes. you see back in 2010 when the bill was passed in the rajya sabha we didn't Sabah, have the reservation there for wasn't the, the oh, for the backwards but this time sonia gandhi made it a point and and and, and other congress mps to say you must have the obc quota with in this uh does that mean that much of this the, the next general election will hinge on these different groups the obcs and women would you agree that these yes, are the key absolutely i agree entirely these are key and i think there the bjp will lose out 
They'll say we have an OBC Prime Minister. They say that. OBC, OBC Prime Minister means what? I mean, I, I, you know, anybody can make that claim. I mean, I think we have a Prime Minister. Forget about whether he's OBC or not. Are you, are you, do you doubt it? No, I'm not doubting it. Mm. I'm just saying it doesn't really matter whether he's OBC or not an OBC. I mean, we've had a lady uh, president. We have had a lady prime minister. What has it done for women in our country? You know, we have had a scheduled caste pri uh, president of India. What has it done for scheduled caste in this country? So, so this, it's all this symbolic. Is all, this is all symbolic. It means very little. I mean, and that's what I said yesterday. I said, put your hand on your heart after all the things that you have done for reservations, for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. How do you treat them outside, in, outside your house? How do you treat these people? And then you, then you tell the world how great we are that we had a scheduled caste president. I mean, what kind, of, what kind of hypocrisy is that? Can I ask you to wear your legal hat as well for a moment? In terms of how this reservation would actually work, how do you think the seats should be allotted to women? I mean, there's a general impression that this would be a rotational yeah. reservation yeah. that would happen. Uh, in some countries, you also have, uh, you know, dual representation, like one yeah. seat has you know, a male and a, and, and a female MP. What do you think is better for India? What do you think would work? You see, first of all, let's, be, let's try and be honest to ourselves. I think by and large, what we say to the rest of the world is not what really is. What happens uh, in, in, in reservations of this nature, supposing a, a seat in which a male member of the family has won, right? And that it now becomes a, a reserved seat for women, whether it's backward or otherwise. So if the husband is not fighting, the wife will, wife will fight. That's what's going to happen. So right now, sons fight in the party. I'm just, I'm just yeah. going saying, we're, we're talking about women's reservation. Mm. We're not talking about husbands and wives fighting the same seat. Mm. I mean, let's talk about women's reservation. What is it for empowerment, right? This is, you say you want to empower women. You can, you can politically empower women, but unless you socially empower women, educationally empower women, economically empower women, this women's reservation is again symbolic. But they have to go together. All that, and there's nothing been done on the other fronts. I mean, how do we treat our women? By and large, I mean, I'm not. Let's, 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 let's again be honest. That's why I call it Dilse. Right? Let's be honest about it. How do we treat them? This is all very well. You can give a great speech in Parliament, what we've done for women and what we've done for the Ujwala scheme and all that. The fact of the matter is, our mindset is not pro-women. No, it isn't. Right? And see what, see what uh, a chief minister of one state has said about this in the past as well, presently also. So the, see, unless that mindset, the male mindset changes, women empowerment, political or Otherwise, it's just a shell. Let me ask you a little bit about this special session and the new parliament building. Firstly, the session itself. You know, uh, there have only been a couple of others that this government has had. I think one was for GST, one was for the Lokpal, and now this. Uh, do you think it required all this secrecy, the shock and awe, what bill is it? I mean, the whole country was speculating, are we, you know, are we going to see new union territories created? Will we see Bharat, you know, made official, the official name of India? All kinds of speculations swirled for weeks until we finally found out it was the women's reservation. Why should this happen? No, but why do you think they did it like that? Or is that because just their style? Do it. I mean, this, this kind of thing, is, he did it for demonetization as well. Notbandi happened just like that. The JNK bill happened just like that. This has happened just like that. That's the way of his building a, a, a kind of a, 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 a the, the, the media is, uh, you know, speculating, busy. busy, what is going to happen. So, so the conversation is around Modiji all the time. And about needless controversies like Bharat and India. Unnecessary, unnecessary. You could have, you could have told the opposition much earlier that this is what we want. Yeah, exactly. uh, what's wrong with that? Have a conversation. If you ask me, they should have consulted the opposition, even on this bill. Whenever we wanted to introduce a bill, I would go, for example, to, the, to, to, uh, to either the leader of the opposition or a minister, say, a human resource development who's been there in the past. I would go and discuss, this is the bill. Why don't we just, you know, sort it out? Uh, but that's, but, but that's, that's that, 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 that dialogue is lost. It, dialogue is lost in many ways. It's lost in the seating of the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. You in see, proximity, proximity is at the heart of politics. 
the closer you are, the closer conversations you can have. You can't be walking 20 steps or 30 steps trying to meet a colleague of yours. One, you feel somewhat hesitant to do that. So no conversation takes place while, while matters are going on, right? And we are f too far apart. You see, if the opposition and the treasury benches are close to each other, we, we can walk across. There's no way that we can walk across to anybody. I can't talk to anybody at the back as well. There are many things that happen during the course of a debate. But let's be honest, idea. even in the old parliament building, how much conversation was happening yeah. between the treasury benches and the opposition? No, there used, still used to be. I mean, of course, after 2015, there's been a dramatic yeah, decline. Yeah, yeah, there's been a dramatic decline. But when we were in power, we used to have conversations all the time. Or even others were in power. Even during Vajpayee's time, we used to have that conversation. We could talk to persons at the back. We could exchange notes. We could send a slip. It's impossible today. Because what I find fascinating is that, you know, we keep talking about ourselves as the mother of democracy and there is so much that has been said about parliament and what it symbolizes for our democracy. But parliament itself as an institution has been eroded so much in the last few years. And you're a parliamentarian, you've been a parliamentarian for decades. H how, many, how much debate do you have anymore? How many bills are being sent to uh, parliamentary committees for scrutiny? It's all come down. Uh, no, sittings, forget, forget. Sittings, are, sittings are far less today. Just forget about debate. It's the culture of regulating proceedings in parliament, which has completely changed. You will switch off somebody's mic. You will not let him speak. You will allow somebody in the house to speak for 10 minutes if he didn't give it three minutes. You will allow a point of order from some side, will not point of, allow a point of, point of order from you have cameras focused yes, on the only on one. You, on yeah, then when the opposition is speaking, the camera will be on somebody else. So the culture of, of that dialogue in parliament itself has changed. The regulation of that dialogue, which is self-regulation essentially should be, has also changed. And we are like being monitored all the time. But, but you're also not, I mean, you're also not scrutinizing legislation the way you once did. But that's partly because the whole polity has become so uh, antagonistic, polarized. Did you ever imagine, since you talked about the role of presiding officers, did you ever imagine that you would see a moment as an MP, as a member of parliament, where a fellow member of parliament would speak about a colleague uh, in the most divisive, communal, vile language on the floor of the house. What Ramesh Biduri, BJP MP, did to Danish. I've seen this in my 30 years long career in parliament. I've never seen this. Never seen such foul language, uh, such venom. Uh, and, and I was even surprised and shocked for the person presiding uh, who said, I look at the uh, I look at the record and then delete it. I mean, I, I just don't understand this. I mean, people like this should be expelled from parliament. Expelled. Except we, we had the Lok Sabha speaker issuing a warning that don't repeat this. I can't believe there is scope to even give another, to, to give a warning. Just imagine if a member of that community against whom this particular hate speech, hate, let's call it that. Yes, yes. If he had done a similar thing, what would have happened to him? And what would the presiding officer have done? Just think about it. That's the kind of venom that we have built in this society, that people of a particular community think they can say anything and they'll get away with it. But that's the point, that hate speech today is so normalized that you can now get up in, in the hallowed halls of parliament. Forget parliament, we try very hard within the court system. And with great difficulty, we got some orders. But by and large, nothing has changed on the ground. Because the administration is hand in glove with those people and nothing will happen to them. So final question, Mr. Sibyl, since you've been in parliament for so long, what did you think of the new parliament building? I know the seating, you're not happy with the seating. Everyone's too far apart. But overall, look, look. we all needed a new parliament building. I think a lot of people agree no, no, on that. Fact, we talked about it when we were in Exactly. Yes. So what, what is it that isn't sitting with you? No, it's fine. I mean, in the sense that you can, it's like any other, uh, you know, seven star structure. It was fine. I mean, uh, I would like a more, I would have liked a more cozy place. I would have liked a more 
uh, a parliament which I felt uh, close to all my colleagues. But I think the government is distinct, distancing itself from the opposition and they do it outside the house and now they've built a structure where they have distanced themselves with the opposition both within the house as well. But it's more than 800 MPs, so maybe it can't be that cosy. No, it should be cosy. Parliamentary deliberations must be cosy, collaborative, expansive, thoughtful and warm. It doesn't have a central hall like the old parliament. It's are you not. going to miss there that? Is no, there is no central hall. Yeah, that's what there I'm saying. No are you going to hall. miss that? Of course. And in any case, we, we, even, even when we were um, uh, in the old parliament, nobody came to the central hall anymore. I mean, the journalists were not allowed. No. So then, see, that, those are the conversations we need in politics. We get information from outside, we share information. That's how, to, that's how you build an environment of, of collaborative legislation. That's all gone. Well, Mr. Sibyl, we leave it there on this episode. It was great to talk to you about uh, what is perhaps, uh, you know, the, the most significant institution as far as our democracy is concerned, which is which is Parliament and and the passing of a historic bill like the Women's Reservation Bill. Uh, you spoke Dil se. You said you have your reservations about when it will be implemented no, and how it will be implemented. Even even if it's symbolic, it's a day for celebration. It is yes, absolutely. As as a as a woman, I would agree with you on that. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll be back uh, with another episode very soon. See you then.